and ain't no wannabes here With some not so nice advice for your writing career To be clear, no punches will be pulled But the punch may be spiked How they like before they get on the mic To my left we got the mighty Mer Lafferty And if I piss her off, believe me, she'll come after me And her co-host Matt Evan Wallace On the right, yes she may be half as hype But she can take him in a fight So settle in folks, buckle in and boot up Time to meddle in a way to make your writer shut up It's hard work, but the perk is that it's fun and exciting Facebook will still be there when you're done writing Ditch Diggers! Ditch Diggers! Coming to you live from Morgan Freeman's Escape Room, it is the Ditch Diggers with Matt Wallace, Mer Lafferty, and our guest star, Cassandra Caw. How are you guys? Doing great. Did you find the latest clue to get out of this room? No, but I'm very surprised that it's Harry Potter themed. I thought it would be something from his movies, but it's He's not. been in his movies. He experienced those for like 12 hour days for months. He doesn't want his movies. I suppose that's a good point. I just, either that or he's just a really huge Harry Potter fan. And you know, J.K. Whatever. Rowling, she's got a Shawshank Redemption uh, escape she room does. in her. She, <laughs> she's a big Morgan Freeman fan. That's right. So they, it's like, it's kind of a thing they do. It's like playing chess, but they do, they build better escape rooms than the other one based on each other's work. I wish this <laughs> was real. <laughs> so perplex. <laughs> How are Mark you doing, Cass? Still perplexed. Still perplexed. I mean, not, I mean, not being American I or like based in the UK or the US, I just sat there for a second thinking, is this a real thing? Are they actually talking about a real thing? Did I miss this somehow? <laughs> Escape rooms are real. Whether celebrities build their own based on other people's movies, I would say probably not. Although you never know. <laughs> you never you know. Really that's, that's the thing. It could be a real thing. We, it, they we have don't the know money. It, yeah, they do. They have mm-hmm. money. They have time. Morgan Freeman has like a whole state full of bees, you know, like he's a beekeeper. <laughs> That's a real thing, and it sounds as made up as an escape room, so who knows? But no, this is all just nonsense that we come up with at the beginning of the show, <laughs> just to fill time. But yes. uh, we're not here to talk about celebrities and their dueling escape rooms based on each other's work. We're here to talk about <laughs> our special guests and her areas of expertise, of which, Cass, you have many. You have many areas of expertise. Expertise is stretching it, but I'll take a compliment. No, <laughs> take it. I, I, I was thinking, uh, I realized you, you fit the ditch digger uh, uh, moniker quite well, considering you are a fiction writer and game designer, and you may do other things that I don't even know about. But uh, why don't you start with telling us about the games you've worked on? Oh, uh, sadly, I've only worked on one game, actually. Uh, oh, she game. remember Cat Phyllis? And it is a color matching puzzle game about injecting cute into invasive brain surgery. Like you do. Mm-hmm. Like you should do. Cute wow. Out. That's really cool. I'm, I'm really surprised and delighted by the reception we've gotten for that game, actually. Partially because of what we're trying to do in the subtext with the kind of slight eeriness that we're trying to produce in it. We're hoping to encourage parents who are playing with their kids to actually bring up the discussion of death and the fact that they will all pass on eventually. It's a little bit of a morbid topic, but I am a morbid person. Weirdly no, enough, it seems to be like, sorry. No, um, no, go ahead. Actually getting recognition for that. We got nominated for a German award for best children's game. Wow. That's like, great. Well, I don't I don't find that morbid at all, frankly. I think that's a really important topic that eventually you have to broach with your kids. And I think that's one that's, I think that's tougher than like talking about sex for most parents. You know, most parents don't even think about eventually I have to have the conversation with my kid about death. And, uh, you know, we use games now to teach everything to everyone, which I think is great. But I, I really, in fact, I think this is the first game about giving a lesson in mortality I've heard about. I think that's I think that's fantastic. I think it's a great way to do it too because it's it gives kids and and parents a context for it. And that's really hard, man. That's a really that's a tough one to broach. That's a tough subject to broach. That's really Thank cool. You. No, yeah, it's really- uh, no, it's um parents appreciate help here and there. This is why there are so many very strange books about sex for children. Um <laughs> <laughs> learning about sex for various ages. How about that? 
Um, I, I, I'm a parent. I've seen some of them. They're weird. Not like perverted weird. They're just weird. But uh, so, so I, I, th- and I, you know, like Matt said, I think death is also a difficult thing. So it's, it's probably very, uh, you might think like, see it and think, wow, that's morbid and weird. Oh wait, no, that's necessary. Kind of like a funeral home, morbid and weird and necessary. Yeah, but I don't recommend taking kids to a funeral home to teach them about death. That's probably the wrong (laughs) move. I don't know. Escape rooms at a funeral home. (laughs) That's even worse. What are you talking about? And so not only you take, so you're gonna leave them there, and then they have to figure out how to escape. Oh my god! With a corpse, with a corpse inside the room with them. With Mm -hmm. a corpse inside the room with them to teach them. This is the worst. This is the worst idea you've ever had. I love you to death. (laughs) That is awful. It's been a while since I've recorded. I'm rusty. <laughs> I want to make this clear. This is not a recommendation you're giving people <laughs> or something that you've done to your own child. I hope. For <laughs> no, 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 of course not. No, she's perfectly well adjusted and great. Um, yes, you, have an, you have an amazing kid. Right? I will say that all day. You have the kind of kid that I hope to have someday. And you and Jim are the kind of parents I hope to be in all seriousness. So just so people know, Murr does not do any weird escape room lessons with her kids. Uh, but anyway, to get back to the topic. So no, that is that is an amazing thing that you have done, Cassandra. And congratulations on the award uh, nomination for the yes. game. Yes. When do we find out about that? Uh, end of the, end of April? No, end of April. Yes. Excellent. On the 26th, I think. Maybe you never send it how I came to know uh, Cassandra's work is through her fiction, though, because we both we share a publisher currently. We are both uh, Tor.com publishing authors of novellas, and uh, I read I read Hammer on Bone, which is uh, Cassandra's just frankly brilliant novella. It was one of my favorites of last year, if not yeah. my favorite. And that is something you also do, Cassandra. Could you talk about your fiction writing as well, a little? Um, oh God, I think I've been publishing fiction for about two years and three months now, and I've just kind of been jumping around genres a lot with Hammers on Bone, um, the sequel of Song for Quiet is coming out this year, Rupert Wong, which is just kind of splatter punk. And right. later in, and later in May, uh, Book Smugglers is publishing my paranormal romance rom-com, which has no blood whatsoever somehow. <laughs> no, which has what not so ever, whatsoever? No blood whatsoever. Nope. It features. Oh. No. It has a weir bear, a vampire roommate, a billionaire fae, and a werewolf in the love triangle. You had me a weir bear. I yeah. was already yeah. there. I didn't yeah. even need to hear the rest of it. I'm in. I'm totally in. When's that That's coming really... out? That is coming out in me, and I'm slightly terrified to see how people respond to that one. No, I'm, I'm, I mean, we're on yeah. board. No, we're there, and we're all. Everyone is always terrified of how people are going to respond to everything they write. Oh, that's God, just tell that's me just about it. For, yeah, that's just part of the course. And then, but I understand when you do something that is different from what you normally do, or different from what you perceive as being normal for the market. Yeah, because people are such vicious bastards. That's <laughs> <laughs> just the truth. That's the thing that I'll tell you. People turn into high school kids when it's time to review books or movies or games or whatever. It's, it can be it can be terrifying. So I totally get that. But I I, I think you'll pull it off, Cass. You are you, you got a great voice, and I really do enjoy your stuff very much. So you're just so you said about two years and three months. You've been you've been publishing stuff. I assume you've been writing fiction longer than that. You just haven't been publishing until recently. No. No. Uh-uh. Really? So you just so you're totally new to the fiction thing. Yes. Literally two years and three months. That is crazy. That's really cool. <laughs> um, uh, I do have about five years experience in nonfiction stuff, though, so there is that. Oh, I, we'd love to hear about your nonfiction background for those five years. What have you been, what have you been doing besides developing games and writing awesome novellas? Uh, so when I was 25, uh, somebody asked me to start writing for them for a video games website, just this little startup thing. And... I realized no one was answering my emails and stuff, and I decided, you know what, it's the best thing to do. I gotta go out there and meet people. So I took all of my savings and traveled to San Francisco on my own and couch surfed for about a year and a half until I started getting gigs. And since then, I've done tech and video games journalism for The Verge and Gadget, Rock Paper Shotgun, PC Gamer, Eurogamer, and 
You are so oh. hardcore. That is awesome. <laughs> oh that my is, god, that is the that bravest is thing. Wow. That is old school. You actually physically went to a new place. <laughs> yes. That's so rare these days. Everybody is does everything digitally and by email, but you actually went to the source of many of this stuff and, and did it. That is so cool. Are you still doing Physically. video game journalism? Yes, I am. Um, I do a lot of reviews um, on and off for You Were Gamer, and I do some writing for Ars Technica still. What's your favorite game right now? I can't talk about it. I'm on oh. embargo, but it's awesome, and it's coming out very soon. And oh, wow. So your favorite oh. game is your, your favorite game right now isn't even out yet? Mm-mm. Oh, so jealous. So well, jealous. That's what you get from that's what you get for being hip and cool and on the inside, Mercy. We're neither hip nor cool nor on the inside. So no, we don't we're know hip. It. I'm hip and cool because I've read. Uh, I, I get to read Tor.com novellas early, and then that's, I get to wander around something. going, "What? You haven't read Rivers of Tea yet?" <laughs> oh my god, that book! Yeah, I know. But uh, <laughs> it's it's. And people are like, "No, we haven't read it. It's not coming out till May." Shut up. But, uh, yeah, no, that, so, is, that is a great book. Yeah. So, uh, but, you know, I, I I struggle with cowardice. I'll just say it all the time. Both of you have... <laughs> no, I'm serious. This is a serious thing, Matt. No, this I It's a serious I, thing. I, because... I think, I, I think that needs to be on a t-shirt, though. I struggle with cowardice. Uh, uh, no, please. I understand. We all... No, please. Go ahead. It, it's, it's, it's just the fact that both of you have dumped everything and gone, coincidentally, to the American West Coast... To fulfill your dreams that uh, just, it just amazes me. And I know this is really vague, but I want you to talk a little bit about how you accomplished that. Just, I mean, I mean, (laughs) mentally, clearly, you know, you got the plane ticket, you went, you couch surfed. But mentally, how do you approach that kind of thing? Because that just makes me go all completely uh, uh, unable to move. Oh. Do you want a funny answer or the slightly more introspective one? We actually have all the time in the world, so both. <laughs> both. Do the funny and then do the introspective. I think that'd be a good Although I do know it's late where you are, so you don't have to go all night. It is. We should to. point out that it is past midnight in Malaysia where Cass is. She was nice enough to stay up late to talk to us, and we really appreciate yes. that. Cass. Yes. <laughs> to be fair, I'm quite a night owl, so there is that. Um, but let's say, funny answer, I have no sense of self-preservation <laughs> whatsoever. Oh, wow. Um, when I was in my <laughs> teens, somebody, no, like my early 20s, somebody led me up into a helipad with a friend. And my response was, could you hold on to my ankles while I dangle off the edge of the <laughs> helipad to look at the world? <laughs> In Perfectly reasonable care. thing to think and say <laughs> while in a helicopter. But yes, that is the general definition of my lack of self-preservation. I should tell you I everything think, about me. That is funny, but I also think there's a lot of truth in that and a lot of necessity in that. I think <laughs> you have to be able to eschew self-preservation to start all over again somewhere and take a big risk like that. So I, I, I think there's a lot of truth in that. Um, it, uh, the introspective one is, I guess, again, a little bit morbid, but I figured regardless of whether you're an atheist or whether you believe in religion, every single religion out there more or less talks about the fact that your existence is entirely finite. So with Buddhism and Hinduism, there's the reincarnation cycle and your span of time as Matt, Amur, or Cass is limited to these 80, 90 years. And after that, you're basically someone else with those memories stored in your subconscious. Same thing with Abrahamic religions where you either have an eternity of burning horribly or you're lifted up and just removed from physical concerns. So no matter how you cut it, there's just so little time. And with so little time, I'm just kind of afraid of wasting it. I don't want to be that person on my deathbed going, Crap, I really should have read them about video games for a living. Wow. That was introspective. That was. I'm I'm I feel very tiny right now. <laughs> and that's not easy for me. I'm a very large person. That's also the most succinct description of kind of Western religions that I've ever heard. <laughs> um, no, you but you're you're absolutely right. So it's really 
a sense of impending of your own impending demise combined with uh, no sense of self preservation <laughs> that allowed you to go to San Francisco on Cap Search for a year uh, to be a video games writer. So, so it was your own it was your own impending demise and being completely okay with it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. What about you, Matt? I know you you did the same thing, and I was just... I, I remember <laughs> watching and going, are you seriously going to do this? Oh my god. Wow. And just watching you do it. Um, well, I can't follow that, for Christ's sake. That was just... <laughs> I, have, I don't have anything about Abrahamic religions versus... I've got... Yeah, no. No, for I... Um, about six years ago, just... I don't know. I We've, we've probably talked about this before, but I don't remember. But about six years ago... I was living in Nashville, Tennessee, and I, I came out to Los Angeles to pursue screenwriting. And I had, no, I had nothing. I had no jobs, no leads, no money. I had no bed, no desk to write at, no chair to sit at a desk if I did have it. I just, uh, I was sharing a shitty apartment with Earl Newton, a friend of mine who's a director, podcaster, writer. Um, but yeah, for me, it was really just, I, I just didn't think about the possibility of failure, I guess. I didn't consider it as an option. I just sort of thought, if I go out and commit and do this thing, then the thing I'm trying to do will be done. It just sort of seemed, it was more like tumblers falling in a lock than um, a question of what will happen. You know, uh, will I starve to death? Will I never achieve anything? Will I crawl back to my, like my mother's house with my tail between my legs? I just assumed that if I committed and did it, then I, you know, the rest would take care of itself. And that was kind of the attitude I had. I didn't allow myself to think about self-preservation or my own demise. I just thought, <laughs> I thought in the very short term, and I and I just assumed that everything would work out okay. And you know, it did. None of it happened the way I envisioned, but right. that's that's essentially what did happen. It just, it's never, it's never. I don't think it's ever what you expect. Um, you just expect an end result of I will write, and things I write will become other things. And that's really the only part that is true, like the actual journey and all the details and what I did in between. No, none of that was like I thought it would be. But it all led to I write things and the things I write become other things. So I was I was happy with the end result. But yeah, just ignorance. We're, we're cast focused on no sense of self-preservation and a really and a really enlightened existential understanding of her own mortality and its ramifications. I was just like, it'll all be fine. <laughs> you know, I have uh, I, I don't. As I've established, I'm not nearly that adventurous, but I was thinking, um, I had a bit of a down period a couple of months ago, and I was thinking, I wished I had the sense I had when I started podcasting, um, because as Scott Sigler says, I was too stupid to know I could fail. Right. And so I was, you know, it was just like, and even when I failed, I learned something because no one had ever done it before. So even, you know, even if you you blaze a trail toward a cliff, you're like, "Okay, guys, there's a cliff here. Don't go this way." So you're right. still you're still like blazing trails as long as you don't fall over. But uh so, you know, I would I would try things and some would fail and some would succeed and I was it, it was all exciting and now I'm not doing anything that's like trailblazing anymore and I'm trying to figure out how to approach what I'm doing with that same zeal you know because well, now, now I'm smart enough to know I sure can fail yeah, and it absolutely. sucks <laughs> but you also have a career now Mer. like the goal the end goal I think the vague end goal whatever you're doing also is to have a career and you have a career now so you you maintain a career and I'm not saying you don't want to stop blazing trails you want to stop innovating but there is also, I think, something to be said for, you know, I started out doing these crazy, not crazy things, these, you know, these, these outside the box things, trying to achieve something. And what I was trying to achieve is a career. And now I have one and now I have to maintain it. You know, we all. Well, yeah, but maintaining it's hard. I mean, I don't have a book contract right now. Six right. Weeks was a one book contract. And now I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do next. And that's right. how I want. That's why I want that mentality of, well, right. I'm going to try this thing. And uh, I, I've lost it. And I don't well, mean I'm, this to turn into a therapy session for me, but I'm just <laughs> saying how I admire your both of yours, you know, gung-ho, let's do this trailblazing thing. And uh, I don't have it. Well, I, I would think that, that, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, I was going to ask Cass about this. So Cass, go ahead. 
I was going to say, Mara, it sounds like you definitely did. It's just that you haven't caught, like, a specific spark to get you excited about things again. Mm -hmm. Like, you've done the trailblazing thing. You have all of that is interpreted very differently. A lot of people will be a lot more afraid of failure than you would be. And you're like, well, okay, I'm going to try something else instead. Okay. That is very true. Yeah. You had, yeah, and that is another way to look at it, you know. You need the spark, Mar. You need the spark. I need we the spark. We need to find the next spark. And I think, <laughs> I think, I think, just... <laughs> <it was the, laughs> yeah. But no, I think there's a lot of truth. I think we're all, we're all looking for that. Um, and that, you know, that's the thing about fiction writing in particular. That's true, but I, I imagine that's true of video games or really anything. Is when you finish something, you're always kind of starting from square one again, you yeah. know. If you have a con, if you have a contract, and you don't have a contract. You have to come up with an entirely new thing, and that's not something that people in every profession have to do. You know, if you're a plumber, you're going to fix a toilet tomorrow, like you fixed one yesterday. You know that, and you're going to do that until you die. I don't mean to make that sound monotonous. I, plumbing is a very noble and, and good profession, but you know, you write a book, you finish a book. What the hell am I going to do next? You know, I think every every writer, no matter what level they're on of their career, we all have to deal with that. Where's the next spark coming from? So that is a way. That is another way to look at it. Yeah, and I think a, and a very good one. Um, I would like to ask Cass, uh, what? Because um, you you do so many you do so many things. You get you writing novellas. You still review games. You do all, you develop games. What are you looking at for your future, either immediate or long term? Like, what do you like? What do you want? Do you want to accomplish overall? Do you think about what will I be in the long term, or do you just kind of take each project as they come? I usually have like self absolutely ridiculous goal that I'm hoping to achieve at some point in my life that I'm chasing. So for now, it's actually getting a novel out, which is harder than, well, I just can't do it so far. I just don't have the attention span for it. I get distracted and pop out novellas instead. Right. So. <laughs> no, I have I have the same problem. I'm not I'm not a long form writer naturally. I tend way more toward toward short mm -hmm. form. So I totally feel you. So that's kind of how you kind of establish goals is like you have a goal like, well, the next thing is I want to write a whole novel. And then I assume once you do that, you'll think of the next thing that you mm -hmm. want. And that's, that is, is that how you approach all areas of your writing, like the game reviewing and game developing as well? Um, with game developing, yes. I kind of want to write for a triple A game at some point in my life. I have no concept as to how to get around to it, but it's something I can strive for. Oh, absolutely. And I, if you don't mind me saying, I think we need more folks like you in AAA games. I think they benefit from it greatly. Oh, yeah. I don't think nearly enough. So that is, that is a very cool uh, goal. No, and I, and I, and there's, and the thing is, and I like that that's sort of how you're approaching it because I think too many people assume they have to have the five or 10 year plan all mapped out for what they're doing. Mm -hmm. I think, I think it's okay to take, when you do what we do, to take each goal as it comes and that will feed into the next thing once you've done it. And they're good goals, too. You want to write a novel, and you want to write for a AAA game. Like, that will take you into the next phases of both those aspects of your careers. So I see nothing wrong with that. I think it's okay for our audience and people who are coming up to kind of understand that you don't need to have your entire life as a writer mapped out, you know, in terms of goals and plans. You just you kind of have the next one, you know. Yeah, I've actually got a theory about that. I, I feel like um, technology has destroyed the concept of the 10-year plan. Because shit moves so fast right now that I, who knows what's going to be available in uh, 2027. Who knows? That's a, that's a very good point. Yeah. So Everything like, changed. Yeah. 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 I remember it's not, it doesn't quite work now in 2017, but I remember like a couple of years ago, I was thinking Facebook and Twitter were not a thing 10 years ago. So how you could have that whole 10 year plan most people's lives been affected by social media in one way or another most a lot and especially with writers a lot of their professional lives are affected by that so you can't even make that an issue ebooks also just blew up all of a sudden and you couldn't have planned for that so it's like i i i look a little askance at those plans because you have no idea what the world's going to be like just tech wise in the next 10 years. No, absolutely. Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, guys. I was going to say, but I also would like to say for, like, whoever is listening in, there's nothing wrong about having those plans if it's reassuring. Oh, true, true. No, absolutely. Uh, I don't, I'm not saying, I'm just saying that's not the only way 
to go to go about it. I tend to think I tend to think that becomes a norm. But no, you're absolutely right. There's nothing wrong. However you do, however you get to, however you get it done, however yeah. it gets you writing and creating, I, I you know there's no wrong way to do it. And that's that's that is a good point to make. Yeah, we try to say that frequently. There's no wrong way to do it because so many people say there are wrong ways to do it, and it makes me mad and want to kick them. Oh yeah. God, yes, very much so. I mean, short of like you know using a piece of pie as a keyboard and typing into that, like there are, <laughs> you know, in extreme, extreme cases there are wrong ways to do it. But you know, within within this even the semi rational realm, anything that gets you writing and producing, I tend to think is there's it's, there's nothing there's no wrong way as long as as long as that is happening, as long yeah. as you are producing stuff and, and pursuing it. Um, but yeah, no, and I, but I do think that the technology is a really good point, Mer, because, uh, like when I started out writing fiction, it was still fairly traditional. Mm -hmm. I never could have visioned that self-publishing and access, you know, the access we have now. And I think the same is true with, with video games. There was a time when the idea of, I think, being a successful indie video game developer was, would, was absurd, you know, because people just didn't have the access to the, to the technology and to the market. So... Now I'm thinking, what will things be like 10 years from now? Yeah. It's actually kind of scaring the shit out of me that I don't know. So thanks, Mur. You're welcome. Thanks. <laughs> I really appreciate it. I am here to broaden your mind and frighten you. No, well, let's let's uh, frighten me a little more. I'd actually kind of like to branch off of that. Cass, I, I'm interested in your perspective since you, you dabble in so many worlds. What do you think is going to happen to these industries in the next 10 years, video games and fiction? Do you see any big changes? Have you, have you thought about that at all? Technologically? Oh. Technologically, not so much, but pol politically, though, it's kind of terrifying me right now. Right. And we go into really dark territory. Yeah. Uh, just as someone who lives outside the U.S. and the U.K., looking at how Reddit is functioning, nine gang little things, like what is appropriate for humor, has it has changed a lot, and that scares me so much. No, just absolutely, that, yeah how the status quo is slowly altering and no one questions it. People are making jokes they would not make six months ago. And if things continue as they will, what's going to happen next? Especially with how people are slowly realizing that they can tamper with the information that is coming online, what the media says, um, how influencers can change what media says literally. Get enough people with enough followers saying this person's lying. And even if it's the truth, people start believing it. it's the whole war of the world thing again. Yeah. No, that's yeah. like the worst case scenario that I'm seeing for the future. And it's like, oh, God. No, that is. And that's another awesome, absolutely horrifying aspect. But I think one thing we have learned. I also, it's weird. I feel the need to apologize to you on behalf of, <laughs> yeah. on behalf of the, the entire West for just how how pol how we're polluting the rest of the fucking world right now. But no, it's true. Like, the truth has been... And I, I really, I know, I, I do see it, Cole. That's not fair. But just like the truth is really the thing that is getting lost. Like it's mattering less and less. You know, it's 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 whatever it's whatever you can get people enough people to believe, and that is that is a terrifying thing. Like when the basic when a basic concept like truth is completely irrelevant, it changes everything. Yeah. And that yeah. yeah, that is that is absolutely terrifying. I do I do think about that too, and you know I I. I'm a big fan of authors who had to write in exile or had to live in exile, you know, yeah. and, and I, and I think about that seems to be kind of one of the futures we're headed towards. If you're a writer, like is, are you going to, am I going to have to move in order to be able to write the things I okay. want to write, you know, because suddenly they're considered subversive or whatever. And I mean, I think most of the writers I know fall into that category. We're all, we're all subversive as hell. And, uh, none of us would, uh, would make it in a kind of dystopian, you know, totalitarian kind of regime. So no, I feel that, and I, and the and the thing is, there's no way, there's no real way to know which which way it's going to go. You want to believe everything's going to be cool, and the status quo will be maintained, and you know we'll all get to do whatever we want, and freedom will prevail. But dude, the truth is, you just don't know. It's tenuous. People people tend to accept that whatever they've been used to will always continue, and that that, that literally never happens. So yeah, I don't, I don't know. But that is a good point. It's not just technology and social media, the internet. It's politics and just reality really so oh, can i add one thing before please, oh, please. absolutely um the other thing that absolutely terrifies me that no one talks about enough i feel is if you look at hollywood and the techno well you would know matt 
definitely. Yeah. But like uh, the technology that they're using to smooth faces in real time and create living replicas of dead actors and stuff, like can you imagine that being applied to the gifs that we see in Twitter and the little videos to make something seem authentic? Yeah. Oh no, yeah, that, I think about that all the time. It's, uh, it started, you know, that started off in a very selfish way with like, well, what if they, what if they can replace everyone digitally in in movies and in television? And then it goes to exactly what you're talking about. Well, then if they can do that, they can use it to do anything. They can make it seem like anything is true. And uh, it's all then it's all about who controls like the means of distribution and what most people see. And yeah, no, that's absolutely terrifying. And the thing is. The technology will get to that point. The capability is will be there, you know, no matter what it's used for. We will get to that point because, like, we're just the genies out of the bottle. There's no way to stop that. So, yeah, that is that is a terrifying uh, concept because they're we're getting to the point where they can make it. They can make anything look like anything. So, we just we got to hope that good people are in control of it. Yeah, and I have very little faith in people, so that's a really <laughs> terrifying concept. Um, I want to go on a tangent here. Um, I apologize, Cass, but I want to talk about um, my podcast. Oh, my, Matt and I have Ditch Diggers, and I have I Should Be Writing. But um, we talked about some political stuff, some political fears last time we recorded, and someone posted saying, well, you should stay away from politics because not everyone may mm-hmm. share your political outlook. And this was a Patreon supporter. And I want to say that um, I thought about that for a long time and I didn't want, I, I remember the cowardice thing. I'm not good at fighting. I'm not good at arguing. But when I, I got to say that I think the world is on fucking fire right now. And if I survive this in 15, 20 years, do I want to look back on today and say, what'd you do, Mur? Did you sit and talk about how to deal with writer's block? Or did you point out that the, National Endowment of the Arts is in trouble. Did you point out that the uh, Affordable Care Act, which is, it helps a lot of people pursue writing careers because they can have health insurance, is in trouble? Did you talk about, like we were just talking about now, First Amendment? Are you able to write whatever you want? Are you able to project your ideas? And I have decided that, yes, I want to be the person who spoke out against this. I want my podcast to speak out against this because it's no longer an issue of your politics and my politics. This is about how the world is on fire and I'm afraid and I got to do whatever I can to fight it. And I'm not very good at standing up and arguing with people directly, but I could point out that things are shit right now and we got to do something about it. And this is the microphone that I have to do it. And if you don't like it, you are welcome to not listen or take back your Patreon support. Um, You know, vote with your dollars. That's fine. But I can't not talk about this anymore. And so this podcast and my other podcast, when it is applicable, will bring it up. I'm done. Yeah. No, that's... Holy crap, you're amazing, Mark. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, if, any, if anything, guys, I think your being here has inspired me. Kind of, you know. Yes. No, but I just, I'll just say I, I second to all of that. And the only thing I would add is there's, there's literally no way to remove politics from what we do and what we talk about here. It affects mm-hmm. everything we do. Yeah. If you, if you make stuff, politics are involved in every way. They're involved at the, at the uh, creative level. They're involved at the professional level. It affects what we're, what we're what we're allowed to get published and what we're allowed to put out there. Like, there's no way to separate the two. So if you don't like our take on it, then, yeah, you don't have to listen. I, I have no issue with that. But we're going to we're gonna talk about it when it's applicable to talk about it. And it's applicable a lot, man. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, right? So, and and, and kind of looping it back around to what Cass was talking about earlier with, uh, you know, we, we have a finite, we have a finite, a finite amount of time. Yeah. It's not, it's not always about what will I think on my deathbed. It's about what am I going to think when I'm still alive 15 years from now and I have to look back on the 15 years before that. That shit matters too. So, yeah. So, yeah. So, 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 sorry for the tangent, but it's something I've wanted to bring up in the shows and this was the right time to do it now. I feel like it was, and I'm Cass. I uh, thank you for standing by while yes. we while we handled that bit of business. I love you both so much right now. <laughs> well, we love you too. That's why we wanted to have you on the podcast. Exactly. Yeah. 
Um, so, Mur, do you have uh, do you have some more questions that you would like to ask us? Because we have we have a lot of Twitter questions, and I want to make sure we get to them in a timely fashion. And we're already coming up on forty minutes here. Um, I think I want to talk a little bit about uh, indie game design and Absolutely. how how you approached it and how you plan on approaching it in the future. <laughs> because it is something I'm also interested in, but I'm kind of I kind of do the thing of sitting down and going, okay, step one is okay. And then I play a tablet game for about an hour, and then I go into self-loathing. <laughs> and you go to Taco Bell, and yeah. Yeah, yeah. and then self-loathing. So, oh. what, what, did, what do you think? Oh, <laughs> oh God, I, can I have a giggle fit right now? Oh, so, I think the advice that I hear a lot, and I also believe in in terms of getting into game design, is having your own games ready for bigger team to pay attention to if you're lucky enough to be constantly working with a programmer or an artist then there are small little game jams that happen across the year there is train jam which happens near gdc and you have to pay a small amount but you actually get to ride a train and work on games for like three four days which is amazing and then there's the annual ludum dare which says make a game in 48 hours and put it out and on a different note if you don't like that kind of um crash course in game making there is inkle writer there's twine there's all kind of interactive fiction engines currently out yeah and, that's what i've been thinking yeah. about looking into and the idea is to just keep manufacturing these little games and diversifying them um beginning with a simple narrative going on to branching adventure trying uh, maybe a pseudo rpg and once you have a small portfolio of that indie game companies will start to pay attention. Uh, I think Phil that our games does not have an opening right now. Yeah. But for many, many months they had this standing invitation to anyone who had published a twine game or any sort of game to just apply and see if it works with them. Mm -hmm. And from what I hear from um, friends in Triple A as well, that is actually true. You do not actually need the five to ten years experience that you see in all of the websites. Just go there with your resume with a trunk full of games that do work that people like, and people do pay attention to that. So I think that's how you're supposed to approach it. That's very Maybe. cool. Thank you. <laughs> no, that's okay. I, I would like to know though, just starting with you, how did how did you approach it, guys? Like how did you get into the actual development side of things initially? Oh, I was lucky. Um, and it's always kind of cheating in a way. She remember Caterpillars is actually funded by a publisher called Yesbert Games, which I happen to work for. And the artists happen to like my writing. So they wanted a story to go with the puzzle game they were making. And after a few emails, they were like, how about you doing? And I was like, oh, okay. And then I gave them a 32-page script and they came up back up to me and went, we can't do this. Why? Well, each puzzle only lasts like a minute and a half, and it was, oh, okay. And I had to cut it down to a five-page script. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you, you use words like lucky and cheating. What I heard was you, you got a job in the industry that you did well, and you wrote a bunch of really good stuff that was relevant to video games, and that's how you got noticed. And so also an opportunity that, presented itself, and you took it. Yeah, I don't that's think there's true. a... That's true. A lot of I people don't. don't. Yeah. There's nothing lucky or, or cheating about any of that. I think that's a way to go about it. And I don't think any of that was easy, by the way. I think you worked pretty damn hard to get to that point. <laughs> Thank you. But no, um, that's, think, a, that, that's a good example. Yeah. I was going to say, I think writers do this a lot, all of us. We apologize for any opportunities that we have all the time. Yeah. We apologize for existing. It's really <laughs> it's a really big problem. But yeah, no, I think, I think also... Apologizing to peers is, is definitely a big thing, too, because it's just so hard to accomplish anything or, or get paid ever for anything. We feel bad when we're the ones who do it. You know, it's, uh, it's tough. Because I think we all know really talented people who are not nearly as successful as we know they should be. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's, a, it's a tough thing. So, yeah, I think apologizing is a huge problem in general, and I think apologizing to peers definitely is a, is a problem within that. But I, like I said, I think that's a great example of what you can do to kind of get yourself into a position to to work in games. And also every all the other things you mentioned as well. And I'll make sure that we have links to everything that Cass just uh, just talked about in the show notes. Yes, definitely. Yeah. That is very that is very cool and helpful, Cass. Thank you. 
But uh, you can go to Twitter now. I'm done. Yes, we have. Uh, Cass is very popular on Twitter, so I'm trying to separate the legitimate questions from all the joke questions <laughs> and, and, and the inside. People love joke. the joke questions. That I don't know what they are. So, but uh, Mike Headley on Twitter had a few that were good. Uh, starting with, where do you even find freelancing? Where do you start? That's always, and that's that's a con. That's kind of a version of a constant question we get here. And it's never a wrong question. Um, if you want to freelance in games, I think Cash just gave you a lot of really good places to start. Um, if you want to freelance in nonfiction, you can move to San Francisco and Cal State. <laughs> Make but sure you some, know the people who's yeah. on whose couches you want to be. What are some What are some other nonfiction um, uh, way of uh, freelancing avenues that you can you can use to start? Like if you if you can if you can't move to San Francisco for a year now. <laughs> oh, so what really worked for me? Like I traveled a lot. It wasn't just San Francisco. I just kind of bounced around. But what right. I did every single week was write up three to five pitches. And send an email to editors that I thought would enjoy the pitches every single week for a year. Oh, that's and awesome. I love they, that. They didn't say anything to me for the longest time. I think I have 600 emails that no one ever replied before one guy went, fine, I'll give you a chance. <laughs> <laughs> but it only that's, took the one guy, right? Yes, and then, exactly. Yeah. And then you exactly. had clips. You had the coveted clip that you could show other people of work you'd done. Hey, it only took 600 emails. Jesus Christ, that took a while. But you are so <laughs> hardcore to have done that. I no, know people I, who will I, quit after five. I am not being gracious. If we had a Ditch Diggers Award, I would give it to you right now. <laughs> everything you've done. That's the thing. People <laughs> ask all these questions. But a lot of people just expect that there is an easy quick way to do this even if that's not what they're thinking they're not but yeah you sent five pitches a week for a year you moved to san francisco moved all, <laughs> all around a couch there you did the work to do what you wanted to do that's what you have to do and that's such an awesome answer and yeah people people underestimate cold calling too that's a, that's another problem i think beginning writers have they're really afraid to just email or talk to people they don't know like that's somehow gonna end horribly when really it just often ends in silence unless you yeah. do it five times a week for a year and somebody <laughs> gives you a chance but yeah that's i think that is the perfect answer to that question if you don't have an in if you don't know somebody who knows somebody then you come up with as many pitches as you can and you send them to the people you think you will like them and you keep doing it until somebody gives you a shot and that's that is such a good answer that is such a good answer to that question i have so much respect for you guys <laughs> yeah but it's, it's it's like yeah. the the main uh writing advice that i try to give which is don't quit just persist. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's really, but that's a, that's such a good example of yes. because we say things like persistence, perseverance, and we mean it. But that is what we mean. That is yeah. cast writing five pitches a week for a year <laughs> to just complete silence is what we mean by perseverance, and it works because it only takes one yes. You know, you get a thousand no's, you only need to get one yes, and you're off to the races. So that's where you start, Mike, and I recommend you go out and do that right now. Uh, Mike also had a question. He said he also says, "I'm also curious how the hell writers handle taxes, but that's just curiosity." <laughs> we need uh, this thing. No, 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 seriously though, we need to do a whole show on that. And I know we need to do a show on that for a while. It's just that that requires a lot of technical knowledge and research, and I want to have the right guest to help us out. So we will absolutely do a taxes episode in the future. But that's not that's really not a short answer to this question. Also, Cas Cas pointed out on, on a Twitter. She is Malaysian, and Malaysian taxes are strange and esoteric. So that's a totally <laughs> different. She has a totally different perspective. And then I imagine most of our listeners tend to be American or from the West and deal with Western tax systems. So I would, unless some of you guys want to, offer, not you guys, you're not guys, unless you would like to offer something now on the subject, I would say that's something for another time. But you could say whatever you want. If you're looking for an answer right now, hire an accountant. Yeah, hired account. It's, it's, it's absolutely, here. absolutely necessary once you become a freelancer and you've got multiple income sources. And you, it's exciting to get to write off your books and your movies, but then you got to write off. How many movies did you see last year? How many books did you buy? <laughs> it's, it's a lot of crap to keep up with. So oh it's. It's it's really good to have somebody else looking out for you and and not and you be less likely to be audited for you know uh, 
writing off your box set of The Matrix. Actually, for The Matrix, the IRS <laughs> might audit you just because you bought the box set when you should have just bought the first one. But um, anyway, the they're less likely if you have an, a, a, an accountant working for you. So that's the short answer. That's a good short answer. Kaz, would you like to add anything to the taxes? I think we're covered all of it. Having an accountant is so necessary. It's yeah. an expense, but I think it's amazing for your mental health as well. Mm-hmm. Just it's just a really good investment. Yeah, fair fair play and totally accurate. Um, finally, Mike, and this is this is a good one, especially for Cass. Um, he's curious how uh, you juggle your different projects. And for someone like Kaz, who you, you multitask on a lot of things, I'm actually interested to hear the answer to that. Between fiction and game reviews and game <laughs> developing and business developing, how do you approach organization and, and, and multitasking and handling all that different stuff? I really like to joke that I don't have any life outside of work, but it's unfortunately very true. I mostly just work and go and get myself beaten up in Muay Thai classes. Like, I... I don't- I'm sorry. That's just that awful. actually sounds pretty awesome. <laughs> writing martial <laughs> arts, writing martial arts, there. writing martial arts. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, but yeah, that's really all that is. Like, I have different projects that take different parts of my head. So I alternate between the easier ones and more difficult ones. I don't really go out and hang out for many hours of the day or watch TV or anything. It's usually just work and physical exercise when I need it. No, I think that's a a great answer. And I recommend Muay Thai to everyone out there, really. Whatever you're doing, it's something to break up the day. Uh, Murr, do you have anything different, any any different methods or methodology to offer on that score? No, actually the way I deal with it is a lot of uh, procrastination and self-loathing. So go with Cass's answer. (laughs) Fair. Um, I for me, I tend to just I'll, like I, I tend to have days where things pile up. It's not it's not a constant stream. I'll, I tend to get to work on one thing and then the other. But there'll be days like today when we have to record a podcast and I have three conference calls and I have book edits to do. And when those things pile up, I tend to just I tend to write. I tend to resort to list making, which I know is primitive. I do it on a notepad with a pen. That's oh my crazy. god. I know, right? But that's that's something that just helped me. I make a list, and then I check things off the list, and that's how I keep them straight. So, there, and again, there is no wrong way to do it. We should point that out. As long as you're getting stuff done, there is no wrong way to do it. Um, Darren Ramsey asks, what, uh, it's an, this is in relation to nonfiction, what factors should I consider to determine the online course versus a book? So, I, And what he's asking is, um, in terms of pitching nonfiction pieces to the online market or writing a book, like what, which, which is the better course and how should you determine going about it? Do you write a book, nonfiction book, or do you start off uh, submitting pieces to the, to the nonfiction online markets? Or what? Oh, me? If you, uh, if you have an if you have a answer. Um, I don't know how much nonfiction pays for um, writing a nonfiction book, so I can't really authoritatively talk on that front. But from what I've seen, it pays to start with online nonfiction because unlike with publishing, the rates are amazing. Uh, and Gadget is $0.25 cents per word. Arsthetica wow. is also $0.25 cents per word. The Verge, wow. Um, if I'm not mistaken, Wired and New York Times is either a dollar or two dollars a word. Oh! And you build up an amazing audience that way if you keep working on it. I've seen a lot of editors do it for four or five years and eventually get a decent enough book deal from a reasonably large house because they have the audience to start with. So I think online to book, maybe. Yeah, I'd say the same thing, especially since... um... It's if you want to write something online, you need a good pitch and proof that you can do your research. If you want to write a book, you need to have the credentials that you are an expert in this field. So if you actually, if you, if you're not well in, if you know, if you have a passing interest in that field, then you might want to write some, start online to write a whole bunch of little things to establish that credibility and then later get the book deal but um yeah you can't it's really hard to to get a, a book deal for nonfiction if you're not an, an established uh expert 
I totally agree. I was going to say the same thing. Unless you're shopping like a memoir, and it's a it's got to be a really interesting one, by the way, uh, in some kind of subject that people aren't used to. I think it's I think starting online is absolutely the way to go. And if you're new to what we're doing here, the rates that Cass was just talking about for for those for those markets, that's a lot. Oh yeah. Like like by a lot by industry standards. So um, excellent point there too. But yeah, and you also want to build up a, a I would suggest a portfolio. Because a lot of times um, you can take what all the pieces you've done online and turn them into a book, and then you don't you have less work to do. So yes, something else something else to consider. <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah, so yeah, I agree with uh, everything that you two just said. Um, my uh, my agent sibling and one of the most talented writers around, Alyssa Wong, asked, "What kind of media do you read, watch to de-stress, clear your head?" And that was directed directly at Cass. So you have to answer that question. Hmm. Oh, I'm slightly embarrassed to say that. Uh, so the rare times I actually sit down and watch stuff, it's always AP's cartoons or stuff like Steven Universe, We Bear Bears. I've watched We Bear Bears far too many times at this point. It's only two seasons. I think I've watched it four times already. <laughs> Never be ashamed of Steven yeah. Universe. Never be ashamed yeah, of watching Steven Universe. Steven Universe is amazing. Yeah, and we all have things like all right. So, so with Steven, what about YouTube? Yeah, Mer, what do you uh, what do you consume to de-stress? Um, Master Chef. I the I, I like watching nice. uh, cooking uh, cooking reality shows, even though the more I study them, the more I see the hand of the producers pushing a certain direction, and it really annoys me. But um. I, it's still a lot of fun to watch people cook and see what they create. Um, I watch, uh, with my family, we watch Steven Universe, Gravity Falls, and Brooklyn Nine-Nine. So that's that's usually what I do to de-stress. Fair. And play, play, good play computer games. And play computer games. Yes. That's, that, is an important, that is an important addendum. Lately it's been um, Overwatch, so... A lot of Overwatch. Nice. I, I've never, I've never been good at shooters, and then my daughter explained to me that it's not just a shooter because there are support people. And when I discovered I could be a support person and still shoot people, it's pretty awesome. <laughs> nice. So I heal and mean? kill. I, I, I play Lucio. Nice. My f- absolute favorite. Lucio is a DJ, and he uh, shoots. Uh, from an experimental gun that is shoots uh, sound waves, and some of them do damage, and some of them push people off. It's the best thing in the world is to push someone off a ledge, especially if they're big and scary. <laughs> you just like, I think nope. that's just good. Words that's to just live good by. Yeah, yes. good life advice in general. I yeah, think that applies I think to so. many situations. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Matt? Um, I, I get on strange kicks and it usually involves nostalgia, you know, like I'll, uh, I'll watch a lot of uh, like uh, clips of WWF wrestling from like the late eighties and early nineties when I was a kid on YouTube or, uh, I'll watch all the sword duels from the Highlander series from the nineties. That, that tends to be the kind of stuff I do to distress when I'm working. I, I listen to a lot of really interesting music and I put a lot of interesting things on in the background. But when I distress, I just want things that are familiar, mm-hmm. you know, and that comfort me. And for some reason, crap from, you know, crap media from the late 80s and early 90s really comforts me. <laughs> well, that's so, so there. Now you know something about me you didn't know before. Um, what else do we have here? Uh, Ty Shelter, a uh, very good writer in his own right and a longtime listener. Ask how do you? Uh, this is for Cass specifically. How do you balance pushing yourself to get better on so many different creative fronts? That's a good question. You do have a lot of creative fronts, Cass. I constantly remind myself I'm going to die someday. <laughs> it does. all comes back to the mortality. <laughs> it does. And you know what? I think that's the perfect answer, and I, I don't think anything else is required. Um, also, we have a lot more questions, and I'm trying to keep it expeditious. This is a this is a good one from Alistair Stewart, um, owner of uh, Escape Artists, which does many many fine professional podcast fiction markets. Uh, what phrases are alarm bells in the early stages of a project? I think that's a very interesting question. So you're doing a project, 
if you hear somebody say something about the project, what what sets off alarm bells in your head that there might be something wrong with that project? We'll talk about compensation later. Oh, there you yeah. go. That's a good one. We'll talk about compensation later. Mm. Any any derivation thereof of that phrase, I think, is good. Um, <clears throat> you know, roy- uh, you know, nothing up front, but royalties on. There would be there be a lot on the back end, which to Hollywoodize that kind of phrase. Anything that involves you not getting paid now or in the foreseeable future, is, is, I think, is definitely a good answer. Uh, Mer- we're not, Mer- you have one? Yeah, we're not friends, so we don't need a contract. We are friends, oh, so we don't need a contract. We are fr- yeah, we're friends, so we don't need a contract. Yes, anything that doesn't set terms. Anything outside the basic tenets of professionalism, basically. You know, no guarantees, no agreements, no money. Uh, you know, wing and a prayer. If they start talking about having faith, I've gotten faith a lot. You know, you just need to have faith in what we're doing here. Oh, we're okay. yeah. Oh, and are you are are you only about the money, or is this you know part of? Oh, don't, aren't you interested in making to, art? Uh, yeah. Are you only oh. about the money? Any, yeah. Any, anything that appeals to uh, your integrity as an artist and uh, not as a business person. That's a, those, are, those are all very good phrases to watch out for. We are and again, not about artistic integrity on Ditch Diggers. We are not. This show. <laughs> this show is about getting paid. Um, what else do we have here? That I assume is a joke question because it's about pandas. <laughs> um, actually, no, that was I think that might have been the last serious one. So I'll go. I'll go ahead and ask it. So Elsa asked, "Did you see the pandas in the leaf basket?" And I assume that's for cats because I have no idea what it means. <laughs> yes, yes, I have. They're amazing, and I'm going to link it to the two of you whether you like it or not later. <laughs> Okay. It has been decided. All right. It is. It is decided. Um, do we have any email questions, Mom? Yes, that we, need to... we do. Okay, then I, I assumed we did. So why don't we get to those? Okay. Uh, Mackenzie says, you know what? What scares me is that, especially since Matt has has gone far away from the bad cop persona, is that so many people either begin or end their um, their uh, email with something to the along the lines of, I figured I'd rather get yelled at than miss an opportunity to get this answered. Oh, God. And we're not, we're not that bad anymore. So, I mean, you know, Matt went off on small publishers last time, but that was not toward the asker. It was toward her self her not self-publisher, uh, small press. No, it was, no. it was toward the small press and their ridiculous contract. But yes, um... Okay, I have a WordPress blog and a Facebook author page. Still don't know if I need to add Twitter to my platform. When it comes to growing my reader base, should I stick with Facebook, Twitter, do both? It's a big social media question. So what do you, like, where should you be? What spaces should you be in? Yeah, what's the best for finding new readers? I, you know, I don't think there tends to be any wrong way to go about it. I think you have to have a presence, but I mean... You know, there are, there are writers who do Tumblr exclusively. I have no idea how to use Tumblr. So it just, I, I tend to be good at Twitter because it's short and it's fast and it doesn't require an immense amount of attention on my part. So I tend to focus on Twitter because it works for me. Um, but I don't do Tumblr because I don't understand how to use Tumblr effectively. Facebook is like a jungle in South America. Like, I, and I assume I'm going to get kidnapped by a cartel if I go on it. <laughs> I don't understand it at all, so I don't. I don't use it. Um, there are audiences is, uh, everywhere. Yeah, there are audiences everywhere. Again, there's no wrong way to do it as long as you're getting people to look at your work. I think so. My my advice tends to be just try try everything and just find the one that works for you and focus on that. But whatever you're going to focus on, you need you need to do that. You need to, you need to give it your time and attention and focus and really build it up. Cass, what do you think? You've already said everything I had to say about that. Just okay. try okay. everything with social media, I think. Um, and- oh, one more thing I want to add. Like you said, some writers don't have a presence at all. I was thinking of Rich Larson. I think he's been published pretty much everywhere, and he right. keeps popping up on years best anthologies all the time, and I don't think anyone has ever actually spoken to him, or at least people <laughs> I know. He no, just that is publishes a- stuff. That is a very good point. Um Kaya Shanti Wilson comes to mind, you know, not not on Twitter. I don't, I don't really see much about him on social media, but he, he writes these brilliant novels that have been yeah. getting all kinds of attention. You don't have to, like, yeah, it's you don't have to have the online uh, presence. I personally recommend it because I think you need every edge you can get 
when you start mm-hmm. out because not everybody is like a strikingly brilliant writer who's going to pull out ahead of the pack just based on their work. But you don't have to do it. If it's not something you're comfortable with or you're bad at it or it makes you feel bad about yourself, absolutely don't do it. But that that is a very good that is a very important point, Cass. You do you don't have to do any of this crap if you don't want to. Yeah. You just want to focus on the work, focus on the work. But, you know, be really good at the work and be really diligent about sending it out in that case. Uh, we have, she added another one about rights. Um, this is pretty easy to answer. I've shared a few of my stories on a podcast for audio narrated flash fiction. Does that qualify as first print or still, can I still sell first exclusive rights for the story to a literary magazine? Um, <laughs> no. Uh, and you're, you're, you're mixing up your, the words a little bit. What you're talking about is, um first you know, first north american rights at least in the west um and that's if if it's published anywhere in the us or canada then it's been out and you can sell the reprint rights even if you publish it to yourself some people say that even if you only publish it like within your own little patreon locked community it's a published story so i'm not sure how i feel about that but you know you put it out there then it's out there and it has a little bit less value to a publisher than a brand new story would yeah i agree with that so that's really um, interesting let's see that's sorry no, take your time. I think I need to uh, start. I, I put them all in all my questions in one folder, which is why I tell everyone, if you have a question for Ditch Diggers, put Ditch Diggers in the subject line, please. Um, but yeah, there's only one person who did that, so I'm going to say that's that's it. That's our questions. Because we just got through all of last year's questions in the last episode, so we're all caught up. We're still caught up, Matt. Oh, that feels good. I can breathe easier. Well, fantastic. And I think timely as well, as we're we're a little bit past the one hour mark here. So that works. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Cass, where do we find you and all of your many, many awesome things online? Twitter, at Cass Caw. Cass Caw. All right. Matt will put that in the show notes. And uh, remember, you can still get Six Wakes. It's still available out uh, via all sorts of uh, ebook and only North American ebook sales, but uh, you can buy the, the all sorts of stuff. I'm not talking well. You go, Matt. <laughs> Murray, you wrote a book called Six Wakes, and I think it's I one did. of the finest space mystery novels of the year, and I recommend everyone go out and buy it. And here's the thing you know how to buy books, people. Yeah, We spend an inordinate amount of time telling you where to go to get books. If you read books, you know how you buy them. So however you buy books, go buy Murr's book. It's called Six Wakes. Um, I write a very funny, very interesting novella series called Sin du Jour. Uh, the fourth, Super funny. Uh, the fourth volume of which, Idle Ingredients, just came out a little while ago. I would really appreciate if you all would go check out uh, Sin du Jour and all those books. Next one comes out in May. It's called Greedy Pigs. Um, Cass, you also have fiction out, and I think you should mention specifically what that fiction is so people can go get it. Uh, <clears throat> I started by the other books that I mentioned. Oh, they are so good. The series of six weeks and by everything else, they've written because they're amazing. So there. <clears throat> okay, fangirl, fangirl moment over. Um, I have Hammers and Bone that is currently out. It is a Lovecraftian novella. Lovecraftian noir novella set in Croydon, and I swear it sort of makes sense in the book. No, it's, it it's awesome. Does. I sincerely, people, I, I'm a huge fan of it. That's one of the reasons that we have cast in the show right now. Hammers on Bone is great. If you like noir detective stories at all, you will totally be into it. It's just, it's really, really good. Also, if you want gore every two pages, buy the long books, because that is bloody as heck. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And again, we'll have links to all these things in the show notes, and I can't recommend them highly enough. Cass, you've been wonderful. We yes, thank you no so less. much. Thank you for having me. I feel like we barely had enough time to talk about it. I know we covered a lot of good stuff, but it just went so fast. So hopefully we can have you back on the show sometime to talk more. Yay. Excellent. You can support us at patreon.com slash mighty murr. Ditch Diggers! Theme song by Devo Spice. DevoSpice.com.